give us a presentation on building community in Toronto, give it up for Priya, otherwise known as Spark Club. <laughs> Well, hello everyone. Hello. How are you guys doing tonight? Woo. That is not my presentation. That looks like no. <laughs> we are each of the trees. Stand here and make stuff up, so. There we go. Okay, so I decided to do a talk about community building. I've been burning for about 15 years, and for the last two years I've been on the board of directors of Burn Tea, which is Toronto's nonprofit. And uh, over the last 15 years, I've watched our community grow from a small group of maybe 20, 30 people to, well, not engaged, but over 2,000 people. And it's been an interesting transition. So I guess the first question is, what does community mean to you anyways? To some people, it's a group of people that you have common interests with, uh, people you enjoy sharing time with. But I really like this definition that I've found. Community can be defined as a group of two or more people, who, regardless of the diversity of their backgrounds, which really speaks to hers, uh, have been able to accept and transcend their differences. They're able to communicate openly and effectively and to work together towards common goals while having a sense of comfort from one another. <laughs> so when you think about building community or developing a community, I think it's important to understand what the stages of community development are. I'm only going to be theoretical for a couple minutes, and we can talk about what we did wrong in Toronto. <laughs> so there's creation. Uh, we start off as a small group, and for many of us, it, the creation part came because we went to Burning Man for the first time, and we fell in love with it, and we wanted to bring it back home. So we all had a common goal, a common interest, it was Burning Man. Then we started to grow. Burning Man started to grow. More people knew about it, more people heard about it, more people come back with that desire. And we grow so big, and we grow so big that we suddenly don't know each other anymore, and we start to splinter and fragment. And that's the third stage of community developing. It's a chaotic thing where um, all of our interests are different, we're going different places, we don't know who each other are anymore. Uh, the last stage of community health development, which is where we want to get to, is collaboration. And that's where each of the different sub-communities that have been created are now able to cross-pollinate, communicate with each other, share with each other, uh, and, and be everything that we want. This I thought was kind of funny. <laughs> uh, this is kind of, back in the day, what... This is how we dealt with conflict, I think you could say, in Toronto. <laughs> We're like, just let's get in, you know, let's just get in the ring and eat each other with foam bats. It'll all be fine. But when you're 2,000 people, it doesn't really work so well anymore because everyone thinks you're nasty. <laughs> it's the last slide of theory stuff. So in theory, what makes a good community? A good community needs leadership. It needs a lot of interaction, and it needs participation. One of the most important things is to make sure that it's democratic and inclusive, and this really draws on the 10 principles. If people don't feel they have a voice, their interests aren't represented, they're not gonna have a stake in it and they won't be engaged. If you're one of the community builders, you need to make sure that you're building relationships with the key people. Uh, so if you have seven different sub-communities, uh, the circus community, uh, the Maker Fair guys, uh, whatever it is, you have to make sure that you're able to identify who the leaders are in each of those sub-communities and draw them in and engage them. Uh, and that's the way that you're going to tap into all of those different, different networks. Uh, you've got to use the knowledge and experience of your community members in creative ways. Uh, you want to make sure that people's skills are being um, improved. So. If you have a group of people who are really strong um, artists or uh, they're really great with fire or whatever it is, if they're teaching people in the community, and you have more people who are able to do things, uh, the common interest and the cross-pollination will also grow. Um, right, one of the big ones. So, what happened in Toronto? 
uh, we started kind of forming around 99, 2000. Uh, we were a really small community back then, uh, so small that when we built our effigy, we would all take a flaming stick and throw it at it. That's how we lit, that's how we lit the man. Um, obviously, we don't do that anymore because there's liability and stuff. Um, but we didn't have to worry too much about community building. We just grew naturally. We were small. But then, by about 2006, we were really starting to grow. Uh, and it was becoming more and more difficult to find that sense of connection uh, at home. And some of the reasons for that are maybe obvious, may not be. I mean, Toronto's a really big city, over three million people in the core. Um, there's a lot of distractions, and there's a lot of subcommittees and other things going on, and it's hard to get people out. A lot of people have different interests. Um, the different subcommittees don't necessarily cross over. There are lots of burners in Toronto that don't come out to uh, drink nights or the events that we throw. They just go to Burning Man, and they aren't interested in being involved in the city. So how do we, how do we get those guys out? Uh, this is not unique to Toronto, but there are definitely some strong personalities in our city, and they don't all like each other very much. Unfortunately, that doesn't always um, bode well for the, the new folks in the community. They see a lot of the infighting and the drama, and they just turn around and walk away, and they're like, I don't want to be part of that. Um, so over, over time, there was really starting to be this dilution of that tight-knit community that we had uh, and a loss of connection. But then at the same time, we have the same small core group of people, these 30 people who are trying to organize bigger decompression parties um, and, and bigger regional burns. And it's becoming, it's becoming increasingly difficult because they're more expensive, there's more people coming, there's all these risks. You can't just put everything on your credit card anymore. Uh, so, people are getting burnt out, and we form a nonprofit. And just to tell you how burnt out everybody was, the name of the registered name of our corporation is actually Burnt Out Interactive Art Society. <laughs> so, this is kind of where I got involved, re-involved, um, and then some of these things happened a little bit for me, some of it simultaneously. Uh, but me and the, the poor souls that I dragged onto the board with me, um, we decided that we wanted to try and change the way that we were doing things and try to inject some new energy into the community. We had a whole bunch of things that we tried, some of them worked, some of them didn't. Um, but here's what we did. Uh, we tried to increase our communication channels because we realized that one of the issues was that people didn't really know what was going on. Uh, even within like what the board was doing, because the board was formed in about 2008. Um, so we created a newsletter that started getting mailed out about a year ago. We built a new website. Um, we tried to make better use of our Facebook groups. Um, and some of that helped, it was, some of it was good. Uh, we created an ombuddy to deal with our fighting. Uh, and that has been interesting, and surprisingly, it's actually been used. Uh, quite a few times uh, for disagreements between board members, disagreements between leads on um, our different events, and they try to mediate a solution. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but it's good to know that you have someone neutral and independent to go to. Um, our board specifically tried to support other community initiatives uh, other than just the straight up two big events that we were really mandated to deal with. So. Um, there's a lot of communities in Toronto, um, I think you heard earlier tonight from uh, Christine and Kim who are leading up Figment for Toronto, um, and uh, Andrew Miller and Antonio who are doing the Circus North. And then we've got a whole bunch of random things like Santarchy and um, Bunarchy and Urban Golf, and we have a couple of theme camps in Toronto, and they're all uh, organizing their own events, and we want to help promote them and support them in any way we can and let each other, all the other subcommittees know about each other so that they can find the resources and help that they need. Uh, one of the other things that we did that was kind of cool is we created uh, new grants to try to stimulate, uh, stimulate more art projects and more community development. 
This was sort of a mixed bag. We got some more art coming out of Toronto uh, on a bigger scale, which is amazing. Um, unfortunately, Toronto didn't really jump on the community development aspect of it. Um, we were hoping that maybe we would end up stimulating stuff like that, the, the backpack project that Doxy had going down here, or um, you know, um, art gardens or that kind of thing. But it, it, it just didn't work. No one even applied. Um, so it goes. Uh, Toronto does newbie picnics um, and newbie nights to try to um, explain to new folks what we're all about and what we're doing. Uh, we still do drink nights. Uh, we try to shift away from the party aspect and we try to reach out to like-minded communities for growth to bring in um, hopefully more uh, people who are energized and positive and wanting to do similar things as us. And here are some of the things that we learned. Um, first one's kind of a big one. Uh, maintaining a positive online presence. It's really critical. Our Facebook group gets a lot of shit on it. Um, lots, of, lots of angriness. So we ended up having to moderate our list quite heavily, which, by the way, caused a whole other controversy about censorship. Um, but in the end, we decided that it was the best way to deal with some of the negative things that were coming out because it really does drive away some of the newer, uh, newer members uh, of the community. And the second thing we did was to develop a code of conduct, um, communications guidelines. If you're, you're going to, if you're going to say these kinds of things and you're going to target people and you're going to be all nasty, well, guess what? Yeah, we are going to censor you and delete you. So play fair, be civil, be nice, respectful to each other. We can have open, uh, honest, productive conversations. And I think since that happened, like we hit a low point, and since that happened, uh, we've really improved the quality of our discussions on um, our Facebook group. So that's good. Uh, so the second thing that we learned is that if you are a community that has a nonprofit or a central organization that's kind of running things and managing your, managing your cash, uh, it's really important to communicate back to the community. We didn't, we didn't do a very good job of that, I think. Like, we would have board meetings, and we didn't post our minutes fast enough, and everyone's kind of going, what the heck are you guys doing? So that was a lesson. Uh, I think we got better at it. Uh, the third one uh, that I think is also really important, and, and we don't always have control over this, depending on how voting, how voting goes, but ideally your board of directors should represent a cross-section of your community. If you want to tap in to all of the resources that you have, if you want to be, um, you know, the hub to the spokes and, and connect people, uh, you need to have representation from across all of your different groups or those kids hanging out on the other end of the spokes are going to be completely disconnected from you. Um, so yeah, just a couple other things. Communities evolve, and <laughs> you have to evolve with them. I think when some of us came into this, we were dreaming of the way it was back in the old days. Uh, and it's not the old days anymore. We're, we are many people, we are many sub-communities, and we have to learn how to facilitate um, the communication between all of those sub-communities now, not expect us to be all one giant happy family. Um, and I guess on that point, you got to give all the sub-communities space to express themselves and to participate at events. Uh, we recently had um, a thing over how our, our decompression was going to go. We've always done a really big event at one big venue, and it's you know, usually somewhere around the range of 700 to 1,000 people. Uh, and this year, people really didn't want the one big party with the bumpy thumb. And one of our community members came up with a really unique idea to have our decompression at multiple venues that people would wander between. And everyone is curating their own space. So some of them will have circus things going on. Some of them will have music. Uh, it's going to have a little bit more of a fly feel. And that's really great. It's, it's exactly the example of giving all of the sub-communities an opportunity to share their own thing and to participate. So hopefully it'll be a great success. Um, 
And I guess the last thing to remember is that community building is a slow process. Um, you're not going to go from zero to 100 uh, all at once. You have to nurture your relationships with people, um, teach people, and, and grow together. So I think that's all I have to say. Everybody make some additional racket for Spark Blood. So, so a hug would be like, yeah. want to hug me? No. Oh, yeah. 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 Y